the first thing I want to highlight, because it's very, very important, and it will contrast with what we do next, is the geometry aspects of vectors. And in particular, the cross product and the dot product. So the first thing to keep in mind, and I think, I don't know why, but for some reason, we use cross product so much in physics for things like torque and magnetic field, and you use it as a tool with the right hand rule to get that third vector, that we forget that fundamentally cross product is what? It, it, it can give you a determinant. It gives you an orthogonal vector to two vectors. Yeah, it does do that. But what is it really? Remember, the title of this is geometry. It's the magnitude of two vectors multiplied together and multiplied with the sign. And what does that formula give you? It's the area. It's the area between two vectors. So cross product is fundamentally the area of a parallelogram. And so if I have a, a vector A and a vector B, and I make that parallelogram and there's some angle theta between them, right, to get the area, I can't draw perpendiculars really well. Imagine that that's perpendicular. <laughs> to get the area, we would take a sine theta times b, which is the magnitude of the cross product. So it's the area of the parallelogram, and it's the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the angle between them. Notice a completely geometric construction. right? I can measure lengths with rulers. I can measure angles with protractors. Those are all physical things. And notice I need to know nothing about components. There's no coordinate system I've drawn. This is pure geometry. Drawing lines of a certain length with certain angles, I make parallelograms, and I end up with a definition of cross product that I can get just from measuring stuff with rulers and protractors. And then the idea that it's also a vector perpendicular to this, again, that's another geometric thing. I can measure the normal to the plane. So the direction of A cross B equals C comes from the right-hand rule, and it's perpendicular to the plane formed by A and B. Now, this geometric idea is incredibly useful because it helps us remember what it, it really means when we connect it to cross products and determinants. So somebody mentioned um, the cross product is related to a determinant. What is it the determinant of? I want the magnitude of A cross, no, if I actually want A cross B, sorry. I take the determinant of what object? I need one other thing, right? Because let's suppose I'm doing it in three dimensions. And the component's like x, y, and z. Yep. So I need my i hat, j hat, k hat. And notice, I need that because what is the determinant fundamentally? A what? A scalar. The only way I can make it a vector is making elements of my matrix actually vectors, so that when I multiply out, I get a vector. So it's really a mathematical trick. But when I take this determinant, I get i hat times a y b z minus a z b y plus dot, 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 all the other terms. And I see that I get out the actual cross product the x component, the y component, and the z component. Now, I've related so far cross product to area, cross product to a determinant of a thing that's a little bit strange because it has a vector as its elements. If I'm thinking geometry, how would I take the volume
of a parallel pipette made of three vectors, which I kind of tried to draw. So what is the volume of this parallel pipette? This nice, so you may have trouble imagining it, right? But I have my three vectors here, and I extend out, and I've made kind of a three-dimensional object with some volume. How do I get its volume? So say it again. Well, what do I do first? I find some cross product. That gives me, what, what basically is volume? Area times height, essentially. So I need A cross B would give me the area of the bottom. How do I get the height? I don't quite want the magnitude of C. We're getting close. And what's a triple product? Not quite. Because right, if I cross, it, it, so let's first keep in mind, is volume a scalar or a vector? It's a scalar. So my only? Not quite. You want A cross B, the whole thing dot C. Yours, I'd have to think about whether it worked during a dot product first. I don't think it does. But basically, I compute this area. That's A cross B. And then what I want is the height. Well, the height is the component of C parallel to the area vector, parallel to the normal vector of A and B. And to get the component parallel, I use the dot product. Because the dot product is fundamentally our projection. So this is that volume. Now notice, now I can make a determinant that makes a lot of sense and actually is a determinant that's a scalar. This product is the determinant of Cx cy, cz, ax, ay, az, bx, by, bz. Because that's exactly what it means to dot c into what we had before, right? Because I'm going to do cx times the x component of a cross b, cy times the y component of a cross b, and cz times the z component. So I've got my C dot A cross B. And it is a scalar. It's a single number. And what we see is a fundamental connection that if the determinant of some matrix M equals 0, that implies the volume is 0. And when is the volume going to be 0? OK, yeah. But when A cross B is orthogonal, C, nah. A cross B is, or, yes, when A cross B is orthogonal C, but what does that mean physically? Yeah, so C is what? Parallel, it's in the plane, or A and B are parallel to each other, right? And if I have three lines in the plane, Right. I can't have three lines in the plane and have them all be independent. How many independent vectors can I have in a plane? How many dimensions is a plane? Two. So I can only have two independent vectors in the plane. So if C is in the plane, I'm done. Or if A cross B is 0, that means A and B are parallel. So if any of those conditions occur, what I've just found out is that that means two or more of A, B, and C are linearly dependent. Now, we've mentioned this before. Um, we haven't been super specific. But let's define that more carefully, the idea of linearly dependent and linearly independent. If I have two vectors, A and B, and they're collinear, 
What does that mean about trying to do this? If I want to take a scalar and multiply it by each of those vectors and add it to 0, can I do that when they're collinear? Yeah, what do I need to do? What would I need to do to make it so that the vector something times a plus something times b is 0? What would I do? Well, I could, I could multiply them by their relative magnitudes. That gives me something that's the same magnitude. But one of them I might multiply by a negative number, and I flipped it. right? Or, or I could just figure out whatever factor I need to multiply a by to get to the same length of b and multiply b by minus 1. I mean, there's lots of ways I can do it. But geometrically, it's obvious what we mean by linearly dependent. Linearly dependent is if I can get this to be true with a and b non-zero. That's linearly dependent. That's exactly the definition. Linearly independent is the thing we're more interested in when we deal with vectors. It's an idea we're going to use a lot. And in geometric vectors in the plane, it's easy to see. All I need is theta not equal to 0 for two vectors. And now, if I want to do, whoops, if I want to do a times a plus b times b and have it equal to 0, this is true if and only if a equals b equals 0. Right. There is no way I can find a combination of a and b because multiplying by a scalar only does what to a vector? It can make its length bigger or smaller and flip it. That's it. I can't rotate it. And since I can't rotate it, there'll always be a piece that's left over. And this is a, a general idea that we extend to any sort of vector space. We're going to use this idea a lot later. That things are linearly independent, a set of vectors, if the only scalars that you can multiply them by to add them together to get 0 are 0. So we'll extend this to any number of dimensions. We'll extend this to abstract objects. And we'll just use it a lot. And now we see, I, I don't prove it here. This is a motivation for it. But this motivates why we will use the determinant to check for linearly independence. Now, if I wanted to deal with four-dimensional vectors and I wanted to check if four of them happen to be linearly independent, I would make my 4 by 4 matrix and check the determinant. If the determinant is 0, then I know they're linearly dependent. And that comes from, if you recall, the rules of determinants that you can switch rows or if rows are multiplicatives of each other, they end up giving you a determinant of zero. And so this is a fairly deep concept in matrices. We use this determinant equals zero a lot. Any questions on that? Just so you know, the two main ideas we used in it from a geometry point of view that we started to introduce, we used it briefly, the dot product as projection. If there are two ideas you take from this course that you see will come up over and over and over, one is projection, using projections. The other is actually phase shift, which we did last week. These two ideas will show up in many disguises. The idea of phase shift and projection. And the other one is remembering that the cross product is both about area and about creating vectors that are perpendicular. And we'll see that in some of our examples.